those of you who have come, we made it. It's been a very long week. I know we're all tired. So I will try and keep this brief. I just want to give you some elements to read some, some notes, to read some articles, to know how to move. So yesterday, you've seen that I have promised in the school some lectures on indirect dark matter searches. But yesterday, I did myself amend this title and called it in a different way. So I amended the title and tried to make clear that these are indirect searches of a specific type of dark matter, which is the weakly interactive massive particles, which come about because they are a good candidate or have been or were a good candidate to solve other types of problems or the problem of the dark matter. And of course, at some point, I was also amended by Carlos as saying, look, this sort of searches that you're proposing is not all the ways that exist to look for indirect, in the, for, to look indirectly for dark matter. So he amended my title this way. Okay, so these are indirect searches of self annihilating wickedly interacting massive particles. And to be even more specific, you know, you should call it in a completely different way using gamma rays and charged particles. Okay, I'm not putting neutrinos because Carlos introduced it, so my class could be this title. But more generically, I think the class is going to have this title. So we're going to be looking, I'm going to give you a primer on how to understand and where it comes about so that people can look indirectly for byproducts, so a generic channel that I'm going to try and explain. So, but before getting to that, let me thank you for being here also because this is the last class that I'm giving here in probably a very long time. I've been here for almost five years. And um, among the many things that happened to me here, this being here was touched by friendship, a friendship with someone that started the moment I came here, basically the first day, and this person is not here anymore. So he passed away, unfortunately, a few months ago. He's been an amazing physicist, and above all, he's been an amazing human being. If you read these papers, Please keep in mind that he was really an amazing person. Everybody that touched him loved him very, very much. So I'm sorry for this, but I had to do it. This is the last time I will have a chance to honor his life, not his death, here. OK? So I can ask you to stand up for 30 seconds in silence to honor Eduardo's life and achievements, please. There's been a lot of happy moments. He was really happy to do physics. He, he really loved it. He, he was with his students until the very last moments. And he was a fantastic person. You can, you can understand what he did for physics if you read these papers. But as a human being, he was really bright. It was, it was fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. So what I promised you yesterday is that we will try and understand from the process that I try to introduce in order to recreate the relic abundance. So do you remember that I talked about the cosmic microwave background and the fact that the relic abundance of the microwave background is basically what we need then to form the galaxies and to solve the problem in, of existing dark matter in the galaxies. Okay. Now, one way to recreate that relic abundance is through something at the weak scale, some particles at the weak scale, so dark matter particles that interact with each other, and they talk to the standard model. So I'm generically pointing to a quark. Okay, They talk with something which is weak at the weak scale. And there are several processes that go ahead. So they can annihilate into quarks, and the quarks can produce them. We don't know exactly what this is, but if you have a specific model, you will have the Lagrangians, you will have the parameters here. So in the early universe, when there is enough energy in the thermal bath, you have it in two ways. Okay? And so they are kept in chemical equilibrium with the plasma. And at some point, when the temperature goes too low, at that point, these reactions are not effective anymore. Effective meaning to keep the balance. Of course, they can take place but not massively. And of course, they can also scatter. If you have a weak interaction, you might have something of the kind. So you have 
a dark matter particle scattering of a baryon from time to time, of course, still at the weak scale. Now, this process is the one that we are interested in, and when you are not in a thermal bath, but when you force particles the one into the other, you can recreate these at the LHC or collider in general. And in principle, you can hope to put a detector that sees the scatter of a dark matter particles of a quark. So this is generically referred to as direct. Again, all of these are misnomers. It's just how the community calls them, right? And this is the one that we're going to be studying today. So is the indirect, OK? So what we're studying is the fact, and you saw it clearly in a plot from one of Carlos' slides, you might have two dark matter particles. They hit each other. They annihilate at a certain rate. That Victor was actually asking yesterday, and we were going to go through it. And they, pr and they produce a cascade of stuff in the standard model. OK? Now, what this is exactly will depend exactly from the uh, peculiar uh, manifestation of the supersymmetry or whatever it is that gives you the coupling between the dark matter and, uh, and the standard model. But what we care about is that you have a way to go from the dark sector into the white one. OK? So you will produce quarks. You will produce bosons. You will produce, well, quarks include protons. You will produce gammas. You will produce neutrinos. OK? And in principle, you might be able to observe these ones, any of them. OK? Take into account that even if you produce quarks in a dense astrophysical environment where the dark matter sits, eventually you're going to produce a shower because this stuff is produced with a specific spectrum around the mass scale of the particle. And as I pointed yesterday, the mass scale that I'm expecting from this particle in order to reconstruct the relic density is something of the order of GVs. And the cross section is, sits around this. Around, OK? And we use it as a benchmark. That doesn't necessarily mean that's the exact number, OK? So whenever I annihilate these two particles into this, I might hoping to be I might hope to be seeing something in the skies, either with neutrinos, either with gammas. Of course, there are additional problems. Wherever I expect to see this stuff, which say it happens here, so the dark matter particles are sitting in a specific point. I point my telescope there. Of course, if I'm using the gammas, I am pointing straight to the target. If I am using charged cosmic rays, they will be deflected, OK? So if it actually annihilates into electrons and positrons and muons. So there is, well, let's say that like that, OK? Which the neutrinos are included, but not necessary, OK? So there's degrees of complication that will complicate the game that I'm going to introduce you to, but I'm going to give you the basic flavor. And then you can ask me questions on the top. Is there any questions so far? OK, very good. So zero order of the problem. Let us say, what are the quantities that I want to hope to reconstruct to understand what the dark matter is? What is it that I care about? Speak up. The mass. And also, to be entirely honest, the cross section, because we know it's around the thing for the relic density, but we don't know it exactly. And of course, if you know the cross-section, in principle, you might be hoping to go back to the Lagrangian, right? If you have the cross-section. But so in a very model-independent model way, what let's say that my, uh, my unknowns are the mass and the cross-section of the particle. I will be sitting around this scale, because obviously that's what I know that generically solves the problem. And it's also the scale that is accessible to the telescope, whatever we know already we're going to be using. But these are my unknowns, OK? These are my variables. So let us say now that I want to compute how many, let's just say that annihilates in gamma rays just to make things easier. I want to know how many gamma rays I do expect from a specific point in the sky where there is dark matter, OK? I know that dark matter is around galaxies, is around clusters. So that process is going to be subleading. Otherwise, I would be seeing it shining in the sky. 
maybe I'm going to get one or two photons, but I want to quantify it and use those variables as the variables. Okay? Very single, simple problem kinematics. So I have a target in a certain volume. Okay? And here, I have a target. So I have the density of the target, and I have flow of stuff incoming, so the bullet, the projectile, the density of the projectile moving with velocity v, and I have a cross-section. And of course, I will have the mass, the average mass of the target and the average mass of the projectile. Can I write the rate? Do you know how to compute the rate of events that I will have? Why am I writing this? Because clearly, if I want to know how many photons to expect from this process, I will have, say, the number of photons that I expect per unit time is going to be the number of events, the rate of events, multiplied by the energy produced in this event. Is that correct? Divided by how many photons. Actually, there is a spectral information there, OK? I'm going to come to that, right? So the first element that I want, I want the rate. This is physics one, right? So the rate of events is going to be proportional to the number of projectiles, correct? The, uh, the flow, the flux of projectiles, so the number multiplied by the velocity, correct? Multiplied by the number density of the target, multiplied by the cross-section. Is that correct? Let's see what I have here. You have number of particles per cubic centimeter. Here I have centimeter second. So this is correct, okay? I have a rate. Now, how does this to do with dark matter? In our case, what's the target? Well, this is obviously uh, per unit volume, right? Then if I want to know it in the given volume, I have to integrate over the volume, right? So how does this relate to the problem of dark matter? One. So I have an annihilation of two particles of the same type. So I have to take one of them as the target and the other one as the projectile, right? So rho target, so rho target is gonna be the density of dark matter. Rho projectile is gonna be the density of dark matter too, right? Is that correct? And of course, to go from the density to the particle, I have to divide by the mass, right? So the rate, in the case of dark matter, is gonna be equal to n dark matter multiplied by n dark matter multiplied by sigma v, the velocity, and that's it, right? Now, I might make this thing a little bit more complicated or simpler. This is what? Right? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So what do I have here? Let's simplify that. That's going to become, right? These I can actually average over the velocity distribution. So I will have an integral of a sigma v, f of v of v, which I call it conveniently sigma v, right? And then I'm going to be having an interesting thing. If I did this, I would be off by a factor because any particle cannot interact with itself, right? Now, by doing this, I'm just squaring it, which is incorrect. 
there is something which is called the multiplicity factor that comes out of statistically integrating over the fact that each particle can meet all the other particles by itself. Okay, so there is a there is a multiplicity factor in front of this that it, if it's completely self-annihilating, it becomes one half, otherwise one fourth. Okay, but for the moment this is irrelevant. So this thing transforms into so the rate of dark matter interactions is equal to this. And again, is there anybody that has been doing the units with me? So this is, let's say that I put arbitrarily this one half in front of it. So this is so right. So I have it per unit volume. And now if I'm looking at a specific target, I have to integrate this over the volume. Correct? Good. Actually, I didn't want this. I wanted this. OK. So what have I done? I now know that the rate of events that I expect from any direction in the sky where there is dark matter depends, sorry, this is not readable, on what? On the cross-section that I, I am convincing myself or I am postulating that it's the same one that created the relic abundance, on the mass itself of the dark matter, on its density in the target, Okay, and on nothing else. Or well, basically, this is information on the target. This is information on the particle physics. Okay. Good. Now let us say that I still need this part. How much energy is released? How many photons do I have from each annihilation? What's the energy released in one of these annihilations? There are t-shirts with it. Oh. Unless these particles are relativistic, which are not, because they're cold dark matter. OK? So we work in God-given or Serpico-given units, <laughs> right? <laughs> and we plug this here. So I know now I can have this, rewrite it in the, ener the flux of energy, so the differential flux, the E, well, not differential at yet, but let's say the energy per unit time, per unit volume, well, not per unit volume, is equal to that, to the rate, multiplied by 2m of the dark matter, OK? rate of events, right? So, the rate of energy production, let's call it Re dark matter, is going to be proportional to something which is intrinsical of the object, the density in the object, Something which is, um, well, actually, here I have another bit of information. It would be sigma v over m squared dm multiplied by m, right? So this, because this is the, the energy. So constant factors taken apart, this is the case. OK? So basically, the energy, the total energy rate that I get will depend on a part which is purely particle physics and a part which depends on the target. OK? It's, very, it's as simple as that. Of course, 
I have to perform some sort of integral over the volume. I have to divide by 4 pi r square, possibly inside the integral, because each volume object will contribute, but this is trivial. What I'm trying to point you here to is that there is a part which is intrinsically dependent on the nature of the target. and something which is the nature of the dark matter. Okay? So if I want to predict this energy flux, I need to know the two of them. Well, I want to know these, I need to know this, because this is what you're going to observe. On the top of it, there is one factor I didn't even touch, is that of course, all this energy, I'm assuming, is just released, but the, there will be an integral of the n over the e, right, in the e. So the dark matter actually gets annihilated into something, and that something will have an energy spectrum, okay? So if I'm looking it at the photons, there will be a characteristic spectrum which I have to renormalize by that. Correct? Are you following me at this point? I'm just redistributing the energy over, an, over a spectrum. So basically, I will have a flux of photons, gammas, and of course, I can change these for protons, for electrons, for whatever channel I'm annihilating into that is proportional to what? To the particle part? to the volume and the density and to the spectrum. I'm going to rewrite this somewhere else. OK. Does this make sense to you at this point? Okay, good. Now, the point is that I have my theory about it, but I, I still want to observe it and obtain information. Okay, so now I have to really find a way that I, a place and a way to observe these photons. Okay, Victor, are you fast with computations? You don't want to compute how many photons I would expect from the galactic center out of this? Well, I can give you this number because I can give you the mass of the Milky Way and you can average it out. But let's not make numbers. I mean, I, I'm going to get to the point. To sh I, I'm not going to perform this number at the, at the blackboard. But what I'm trying to point out is that obviously this flux is suppressed, as you were pointing out yesterday. Because if it wasn't suppressed, dark matter would be annihilating into baryons effectively and you wouldn't have the dark matter around. And therefore, that would not be the dark matter. Otherwise, it wouldn't give stability to the galaxies, right? So this number is obviously so small in the parameter space that I'm interested in that it doesn't suppress the amount of dark matter such that it gets depleted. Otherwise, you would lose it, okay? This is an a posteriori argument. You can work out the numbers yourself. So let's say that now I want to play with a real target, okay? Now, there is one point. First of all, this is not a density in a small volume. When I look at the total, when I look at the target, and now we're going to be seeing which sort of target I can use, I'm going to be dealing with a specific object, and the density of dark matter, as we saw, is not constant in that, in that object. Okay? So you remember that the rotation curve goes down, the one that you expect from the baryons, you see it constant, and we discuss the fact that you expect the dark matter to be concentrated more outside. So every object will have a dark matter density, has a distribution. Well, in theory, it actually is like this. 
within the object, okay? So if you are close by and say you are looking at the galactic center, you have to consider the fact that the dark matter is distributed in a certain way around the galactic center. And when I'm looking at the galactic center, if I want to know the flux to expect, I have to get this out correctly. Why? Because I want to know this, right? This is the object of the game. And if this is the quantity that is, that is observationally accessible, what is it that I have to know exactly in order to extract from these this information? Hmm? I have to know, I must know beforehand the density distribution and the spectrum. Hmm? Well, you don't measure, well, you measure an observed flux of gammas, but you don't know what the spectrum, the intrinsic spectrum of annihilation is. But as a matter of fact, you don't even know exactly what the dark matter distribution is like. So I'm trying to point you to the fact that whenever I access this thing, I want to access this thing, I will be faced on uncertainties on this, delta astrophysics, let's put it this way, well, delta distribution. Some additional theoretical things, right? On the top of it, this is obviously going to be known with a delta flux, because that's something that you observe with the CTA, with Fermi, and whatever it is. All right, very good point. The last term is model dependent. But again, this is a generic formula. So whenever I perform my analysis, I will get an answer about this, which is model dependent. Is it clear what he's asking? That, that's a very good point. But I was hoping to get uh, to this part uh, just in a second. Any more questions about this? Chicos? Are you good? Is everybody good? Like we're going to go very slow because it's the end. I want you to absorb a little bit of information. I don't want you to get to the details. but so. It's clear that what people are asking you if you are an observer is this quantity. But it's clear that you have to cope with all the rest. Now, don't let me get into the details because that's what I do uh, currently to measure the dark matter distribution in Milky Way so I can get into a lot of details. But the thing is that one thing that you will find out many times when you're doing direct search is people, rather than using the actual determination of this that you can take from stellar distribution that are affected by huge uncertainties, they take profiles from simulations. You will hear it a lot of times. So you will, you will read, if we use an NFW, which stands for Navarro, Frank, and White, if we use an ANASTO, if we use a adiabatically contracted profile, and so on and so forth. That's the reason why when you use different things, different profiles for the dark matter in a target, you will get a different result on that because the observationally accessible quantity is this one, okay? But for the moment, let's just play, and then I will tell you why I think it's wrong or maybe I won't tell you, but it, it's a good benchmark. It's a good feeling to have an idea of what's going on. But when you're doing science and you want to reconstruct this, if you're observing a real object, you have to observe, you have to use real data with real uncertainties. Okay? But let's get to that later on. Now, let us say that I know the flux, I know the spectrum, okay? Right? So I am assuming that I know the spectrum, and I'm saying my stuff, my dark matter particles, they annihilate into, into gammas. From, no, let, okay, but this promptly goes into gammas, okay? Immediately, you have, you have a little bit of gas around, wherever this annihilation takes place, it goes straight into gammas. 
So this characterizes me a certain dn, dn in dE for the annihilation into, into W bosons, okay? That was Victor's point, it's model dependent. But let's say that I know this dn in dE. First of all, how will be, how this, how will, this will be made, this spectrum? There is one feature that you can predict. Only one feature that you can predict. So I'm asking you how the photon spectrum as a function of the energy varies with the, well, the, the photon spectrum and function of the energy. Assuming that I know, I don't, but assuming that I know that this annihilates into a specific channel and given the mass of the particle in its cross section. Is the cross section, this is the prompt annihilation. So this is the annihilation of only two particles, okay? I am not, it's not the total flux. What I'm asking you here is only one particle annihilation. Does this matter? Phase value, no. This is giving you the probability that this happens, but it's not telling you what's the spectrum. Does this matter? Yes, why? It gives you the final energy. There's nothing that can be above the mass of the particle, right? So however the spectrum is, is done, is made, it will have a cutoff at m or 2m, okay? So you can't produce particles. <coughs> So you already know that whatever you're looking at with your telescope, you want to be sensitive to a particle mass above the sensitivity. Well, you are uh, below, below the sensitivity of the telescope, okay? Right? So this is an important feature already. Of course, depending on what sort of particle you inject here, you will have a different feature, but let's say that we know it. Okay, so now, I am pretending at this point that I'm observing a specific target, let's say an individual galaxy somewhere, okay? Somewhere outside of the Milky Way, just to make things easy. And then, so we are here, that's the Milky Way. Then I have some nice galaxy over here, and we are observing it from here. And there is a certain distance d that I know perfectly, okay? So right now I'm playing the game and I know that I wanna know sigma v over v over m. I know the density distribution inside the galaxy. I know the distance and I know the N and D. Okay? So basically, I am predicting the flux, I'm exactly predicting the flux of gamma given the object, the target, given the channel, And the only piece that I'm looking at, looking for, is this one. This is my unknown, okay? This is now a number, the only unknown is this one. But I know that it's sitting around those magic numbers that I'd written here and erased. Three, 10 to the minus 26, give me centimeter per second. So whenever I am looking in that direction, I am looking at the N in the E. This is the observed stuff. And let's say that I have a sensitivity up to E equal 1 TV. Okay. Let's say that for some reason for the moment, let's, let's keep the game simple and I know the mass. Okay, I know that the mass is uh, 500 GV. Okay. So what do I expect to see here? 
in, in these, there is the, my observations. I expect to see a flux, assuming that I know the shape of these, and assuming that the shape is a box, which makes it easy. What do I expect to see here? This is the observations at Earth. The same box. And that's it. Where this is the mass of the particle. Of course, the level of this expectation will depend from only one variable. Which one? The only variable that I said I don't know yet. Sigma v. Right? Right, Mom? <laughs> now, let's say that this is the prediction for sigma v1. We call it 1 because it's our benchmark. Okay? What is the, the uh, prediction for sigma v smaller than sigma v1? Let's call it sigma v0. Where is it going to be? Higher or lower? Lower. Right? It's just directly proportional. And of course, for a bigger one. Actually, this is stupid. OK, I don't know if you were seeing where I want to get that. OK. This is a pure case. I know everything. I know where this galaxy is. I know the spectrum. Of course, this game is a little bit complicated because if I introduce the mass as a variable, what I expect is going to wiggle a little bit. But, but this gives you the flavor. Now, now I'm at the boundary where I feel comfortable with in theory and experiment. This is the flux. How does a sensitivity curve look like? Have you ever seen a sensitivity curve of CTA? Johannes was showing it. It looks something like this in this plane, the N and the O or the F and the A. Right? Brigade, yeah. Josie. Uh, we cannot take the coffee break outside, so you will have to take the sugars in here. But say algunos guardanapinos. Muito obrigado. So, what is this telling you? This is telling you that given your experiment, there are Cross sections that you are sensible to and you can hope to observe, and cross sections that you are not sensible to, okay? Given the energy range of your telescope. That's, that's the game. As I said, this game is complicated by the fact that the spectrum might wiggle a little bit. But don't forget that here I am playing the game that, the, that I know the spectrum for, say, WW annihilation, annihilation into WW. So if I want to see it, so basically you're asking, let's say that you put a criterion for observation. You're asking that my flux of gamma from dark matter annihilation into that channel must have, I don't know, more than five photons in that channel, right? It's a criterion. Of course, the criterion is going to be exactly that. It's going to be more complicated. But so it must be more than a threshold. Let's, we're taking it integrated, OK? If I know everything, that will be the requirement, since I know all the other pieces, that sigma v over m is bigger than k divided all the other terms of the flux, right? Correct? So basically, I'm telling you that if I want to look at things in the plane sigma v over m, The product of the two has to be above a certain line. Now you can deconvolve this line with the sensitivity of the instrument, and it's usually going to be looking something like this. OK? So you're going to be sensible to a region above. OK? 
This is what you see when you see sensitivity plots of instruments like CTA, Fermi. Does it make sense to all of you? At which level this sigma v will be will depend on the sensitivity on the instrument. And this line will also depend on the channel. So this is what Carlos was showing this morning, that you have different lines for different channels because this is, this is the spectrum produced by WW annihilation. If I were producing, if I were annihilating everything in neutrinos and I was looking with gammas, what would be the sensitivity line? Where would this line be? If, so now I'm playing the game saying, I know this spectrum, this is the spectrum for annihilation in W plus W minus, which has a sizable gamma production, okay? But let's say that I change my, I, am, I still keep looking in gamma, but my model only annihilates into neutrinos. The line would be infinitely high because this spectrum would be, in gammas, would be infinitely small. Probably not zero, there's some rarely neutrino gamma, but infinitely away, right? As a matter of fact, well, obviously you have different, so this is for the WW, typically electrons couple a little more and muons couple a little less. Okay, right? So this is E plus, E minus, this is mu plus, mu minus. All right? So this is a prediction of what I should be seeing. But on the top of it, don't forget that given only one single line, I am playing this game by pretending that I know exactly the profile of dark matter distribution in that object. Okay, so each one of, the, of these lines, and let me erase. So this line corresponds to using an, a certain power law. So rho dark matter is equal to the radius to the minus two multiplied by some constant. Okay, the, and I'm plugging it there, and this is the prediction I have for the sensitivity. But if I use a different profile, so I change this function, it will be either more sensitive or less sensitive. Okay? Does it make sense? So whenever you read a sensitivity plot of this type, it will depend on the channel, it will depend on the dark matter distribution that you're assuming in the target. What I've been arguing in the community, or at stress, in fact, people hate me or just ignore me sometimes, is that for many objects, we know the dark matter distribution with huge error bars, and we should use the real error bars instead of some benchmark profile. Because, now let's go, this is a prediction for what I should be seeing with the instrument. But let's, let's make a, an example of what I actually see with the instrument, okay? So, Let's say that uh, the man with the beautiful name, Fabio, gives me some observations from Fermi. And uh, you're pointing them this time somewhere else. I don't know, the galactic center. Okay? And I see this. Obviously, you don't see this, but that's the end of the spectrum. And say this is somewhere around 500 GeV. Okay? I'm pointing it toward the galactic center. <laughs> now you want to play this game with the dark matter. And Fabio says, are you crazy? There's a lot of shit in the galactic center. This is obviously just the flux I'm observing, right? Who tells you this is dark matter? Okay. I have a very good model. I think I know what I see in the galactic center. So I know that my model predicts something like this. So this is the observed flux. This is my best model. For the normal astrophysics. Okay, 
So my equivalent observation in the dark matter space is something that looks like this. Can anybody help me to draw this? So here they basically overlap. So it's 0, 0, 0, 0. Then I made something like a bump around here, and then 0, 0, 0, 0. That's the equivalent. Now this is what I have to work with. And usually the error bars of the observations are not like this, they're like this. And the error bars of your modeling are like this. So the error bars of this are like this. So what it happens is that rather than saying the flux of dark matter is something, you're saying the flux of dark matter has to be smaller than the residual flux observed. OK? So rather than having this plot, I will have this plot. But it will tell me that dark matter can only live here, in this region, because I haven't seen anything above. Otherwise, I would have seen a bump, right? If it was predominant, which is a little bit the case here that I drew. But you always, you always have to take into account error bars, OK? Now, let's make a quick break while you take a little bit of cake. Oh, go ahead. Is there anybody with questions? I'll take one and then. <laughs> Someone who doesn't have the cake right now. Wait a second. Let me give you a mic, OK? The funny thing is that if it's forbidden in the auditorium, it's not recorded. Yes. yes. And so my question was just, um, in papers, though, are people normally conservative with their error bar treatments? They every, the error bars are always taken into account. Yeah. Less so much. Can I have those uh, napkins? Like, you can circulate them. So error bars on the observations are usually, now I'm giving you a very coarse view of this, right? Yeah. yeah. These things are done with a completely different techniques to, wait, to treat the spectrum, of course. This is, this is just to give you an idea of how it works. But typically, on the observations, the error bars are taken into account. What I feel that sometimes is missing is it's only in some cases and sometimes the information on the dark matter density is missing. Sure. It's okay. always like a Maxwellian distribution or something. No, it's wait a second. Wait a second. There is, there is an additional one. One thing is the dark matter distribution in the object. Yeah. So that's a density profile. Sure. Of course, that would correspond to a to a phase space distribution that it could be Maxwellian and you could integrate it at zero momentum as the density. Sure. But you don't get to this level. You're just extracted from the dynamical arguments. Yeah. But most people, what they do is just they take, not most people, but generically, what the community does is to take either an NFW or an NAS to normalize to the mass of the object. Mm. But don't forget that these things are actually measured in astrophysics, and they have huge error bars. So when you start including that type of error bars, it multiplies, OK? OK. I'll do the mic, by the way. More questions along these lines? Now, one way to, uh, to reduce the problems with uh, with the fact that you have a flux from other objects and that confuses you, is to look into objects where there are no other sources, right? So let me, let me recap a little bit because I'm going a little bit tangent. If I am looking at the gamma flux, gamma, let's call it gamma, but it can be anything else, okay? 
If I'm not going to look at the, at the shower produced by the, um, the dark matter annihilation in any of the channels, I want to maximize that, right? I'm an observer. I want to I be in the conditions that maximize this thing. So what can I do to, ma to maximize this um, three-part object? These I cannot touch because this is given by the nature of the particle, and these I cannot touch, right? Either I go in places where the density of dark matter is very high, or given that my observation sees the dark matter and the other objects, the normal astrophysics, I go in places where there is less contamination. It's one of the two, or ideally both of them. So when you look at dark matter, say it's from gamma, but from, I don't put it there while I'm giving class. Oh, no, I cannot. So one, one way that it works is that say, people say, okay, at the galactic center, I expect the density to be very high. The amount of dark matter is actually not big because of the reasons we talked about yesterday, but the density tends to be a little higher than in other environments. So that target is typically chosen because it maximizes this. But on the other hand, it's Hell's Kitchen, right? You have all sort of stuff. You have pulsars, you have gas, you have cosmic ray propagation. So the, the noise or the signal that you get is humongous. The other way that you have is to say, okay, I go in objects where I have nothing else and I try to look for dark matter, which is, for instance, the case of dwarf galaxies. I know that dwarf galaxies are, are um, very, uh, the luminosity to mass ratio is very low, or the mass to luminosity ratio is very high. And so they're objects entirely dominated by the dark matter. To my knowledge, there is not a single high energy photon until a few years ago observed in a dwarf galaxy because they're dead, because pulsars have been kicked out. So you say, well, look, it's an environment which is very dense in dark matter that has no uh, contamination. I'm going to point my telescope there, right? Of course not, because you get the CTA collaboration, the Cherenkov Telescope Array, that has priorities, costs to run, and they ask you, why the hell should I point my telescope in a place where I don't expect anything interesting for most of the community? If there are no gamma ray sources, why should I point it there, right? Well, my generation, or the people that formed a little bit after me, were mind blown by the fact that the dwarfs are a fantastic target, which actually is if you have infinite resources, because Fermi was a sky survey. So Fermi was just looking at the whole sky every three hours. So it hits a lot of dwarf galaxies. Incidentally, you stuck them. But when you have to point your telescope in a given direction, you have priorities, okay? So that's one reason. The other thing that you might want to look at is a feature. If you're looking to a spectrum of annihilation, that may have features, okay? And that might be something characteristic, it's a signature of dark matter annihilation. So you will find in the literature a lot of references to spikes, to lines. There could be a line around the mass particle. That's what people thought they had found around 130 GV. That's, that's an obvious feature from the particle physics point of view. You have two particles annihilating, you might have some process that announces the, uh, the emission around that mass. So the spectrum would look, the, the, the one particle spectrum would look something like this. And if you see that somewhere, and you manage to exclude any other astrophysical mundane explanation, that's a feature. Okay, what else? Throw me ideas because I'm a little tired, so I'm running out of uh, ideas on which to train you. Victor. What was it uh, produced with anything for the gamma, from the W? The, the dark matter annihilates into, into Ws, and the Ws cascade down in the medium. Okay, and, and the next question is, is it's not easier to uh, look for this in let's say, early universe where the density of dark matter is much higher? It's That's a, a fantastic to, question. To, you know. Well, but then they would be absorbed in the meantime. What? They would be absorbed in the meantime, right? Yeah, but like the CMB is still alive. You can find a, some kind of signal. Over what, there. what sort of signal? I don't know, something that we don't know what it is. That's a, the, I'm, I'm trying to tease you because I, I want to see... So what happens to a W photon, to, to something produced at 100 GV energy 
What do you mean with uh, with the early universe? Uh, when the density is much higher. So that's that's a very good point. But when? Before or after the same information? I don't know. Actually, then I was thinking about the, the dark matter dominated era. It's not a, like a stronger presence of dark matter during the. Okay. Good. Thank you. Let me take two points. So is it clear what Victor is asking? Saying, look, it's exactly what I was saying, but I wasn't saying it. It was brilliant. You go to a, a place where the dark matter density is higher. And we know that the dark matter density, the cosmological dark matter, the cosmological density scales like today's. <laughs> Right? This is a cube because it's a it's common with volume, right? Is that okay? Are you com comfortable with that? So whatever it's in this interstellar space, it spikes up, okay? It goes, the, just the environment stuff is factor cube denser. This is a very good idea, but what I'm objecting is that if you form stuff at 100 GeV, this thing will get redshifted down. Now, there's actually several things that you can do with this idea, and it's a very good one, and people have worked a lot on it. So, one thing you start doing it locally, because now I'm telling you, well, I am looking at specific objects, and I'm trying either to see it or rule out cross sections. But, I may just imagine, without necessarily having even to go to the cosmological density, but something very similar, that since around me there's plenty of galaxies, right? Whatever, since in the high energy photons very likely get out of the galaxies, I might simply integrate the flux around me, okay? So I have that formula, but then the rho dark matter over the radius, which in case is the distance, is actually, I wanna put it Let's put it as a redshift, although this integral on the small galaxies is going to be limited to 0 to, say, 0 0.5. Let's put <laughs> redshift 1, okay? So this integral of the dark matter over this volume will become every... This is a field, right? This is the density field from here to redshift 1. The interstellar space, intergalact intergalactic space is negligible, it's suppressed. Here, you basically have the number of galaxies multiplied by rho of each individual galaxy. Does it make sense? I am integrating this flux over the entire sky, and basically I'm counting each individual galaxy. This is not what you asked for, okay? But it's an idea. It's an additional idea. If I don't resolve the objects, I will get a diffuse from all the sky. That is the summation from here up to redshift 10 when the galaxies form of all the galaxies that I see as a diffuse. Beyond redshift 10, galaxies basically don't exist. This is not true, but more or less. So I might be seeing a second term, which is what you're asking, right? So a, a, a part of this integral, which is from redshift 20 up to redshift 1000, now I tell you why, all the interstellar medium, the intergalactic medium. It's not entirely correct, but it's true that mostly, since the galaxies have not formed yet, this thing is diffuse, so it will be the integral of rho dark matter of, this, of that redshift, which is equal to rho naught, or proportional, over the z and the volume element, okay? So this part of the integral could be dominating because this thing is very much redshifted because of z. Why am I putting this? Redshift 1000. No, it's totally arbitrary as a matter of fact because that's the CMB, okay? So the problem is that this stuff is formed. So first of all, in the observation, each gamma photon is produced at each redshift, it will be redshifted down in energy. So if I produce it at redshift above 20, I will have a sizable fraction. Actually, you can compute this diffuse flux and it shifts down. 
and you can compute this flux. Let's separate it before CMB for, for convenience, okay? But actually, this flux, you are not gonna be able to see, okay? It basically falls into sub-100, if you're assuming at one TV particle, most of the flux is produced at redshift above 100, so it's sub-100 GV where the flux is entirely dominated by other things. Does it make sense to you? If, if I am producing most of the flux at around one TV, okay, at redshift more than 100, which is where this integral is gonna be dominated because it's, it's dominated by high Zs, the bulk of the flux is gonna go down by a factor 100 plus one, at least. So not only you distribute the, the total energy density, but you also distribute the central frequency, you take it down. So this thing is gonna fall below 100, 100 GV, okay? So this is one thing. Still the idea is very clever because what happens to this stuff? This has time to degrade in energy. And in fact, the reason why I put around 1,000, and I can give you the papers on it because it seems it's very interesting. What happens is that you, pre, you produce the bulk of the energy in annihilation at the scale which is, say, 100 GV to 1 TV. But if there is a lot of stuff around, basically protons and electrons, which is still the case until redshift 600 because CMB doesn't really finish by redshift 1000, it's an approximation. All these very high energy photons, most of them, they degrade in energy so much they actually enter into the CMB. They alter the CMB properties, they ionize the gas. By ionizing the gas additionally, you create features in the CMB that are related to a potential dark matter annihilation. So what, you're, what, what it came out of, of you is basically one method that people have been using, myself included, and it's basically an indirect way to look for the dark matter but using the CMB at this point. But you're still, still through the production of gammas, electrons, and positrons. Are you guys lost? No? Seriously? Still. You know, I'm saying gammas, but say that you annihilate the dark matter entirely in electrons and positrons, even worse, because they lose energy even faster. So there are different ways to use this phenomenon, the annihilation of dark matter in different environments, using different observables. If it happens locally, you're using the gammas, the electrons, and the positrons. Let's play another game. I'm teasing you. I'm, I'm, I am done with the bulk of the thing, but let's play another game. You have dark matter annihilating, and you know that the branching ratio is, so you have, K plus, they annihilate, and then it goes. One third in W plus minus, which eventually is gamma. One third in protons, and one third in, L, in E plus E minus, okay? It just does. It's one third, one third, and one third. Now, where are you gonna look at things? I will look at everything, right? But I'm sitting in the, in the disk of the galaxy. This is the center of the galaxy. And I know that if I, that the gammas travel straight. So if I look at here, or at this galaxy, at, at the external galaxy, I should get a signal, right? This is in gammas. This is suppressed by R, one over R square. Of course, this is also, in, but this D is smaller, okay? But so I wanna look at all, in all directions, and especially where there is more dark matter. Now, let's say that there is a spectrometer in space Let's just pretend that there is a spectrometer in space that can, can measure the protons. Where is it gonna look? It's not gonna look anything, anywhere. It's not gonna look in any specific direction. It's just gonna measure the particle. 
But it turns out that protons, well, you can go back to the classes of Pasquales and find out that this instrument is mostly going to be sensible from, to protons coming from all over the galaxy. So the, this instrument here, you have one instrument to look at the gammas and you can look specifically, and another instrument that is measuring whatever comes from the whole galaxy. And then let's say that you have another instrument like Fermi that can actually measure the electrons, or Pamela that can measure the electrons and positrons. What is it, which region are you probing with electrons and positrons at the 100 GeV? We're saying that we are around GeV, 100 GeV. Well, they diffuse. So, do I have directionality? Can I point it straight like a gamma? No. So I'm sensible to, I, I don't have sensitivity to the space. It's like the protons. Am I sensible then to the whole galaxy? No. Because at 100 GeV electrons radiate synchrotron, and their synchrotron losses make a volume which is more. So you are sensible, actually, to this region, to a smaller region. And the smaller is the energy of the electrons, the bigger is the region you are sensible at because the synchrotron losses are less. So I'm trying to tease you by introducing increasing elements of complication in this game. This was the flux of production. That doesn't change, but then the way the observable gets to you is different. So I have to take that into account. The CMB, for instance, and of course, if you're getting a constraint or an observation, this is what happens. People claim an excess in gamma rays toward the galactic center. Okay, good. In order to produce that excess, your theorist friend tells you that that must be the model. You have three possible models. But they equally produce a huge amount of electrons that you do not see in this experiment. This is actually often the case, or the other way around. You see a huge amount of positrons, but then you don't see it in the gammas in another direction. Then it cannot be dark matter. And this has been done for the past more than 10 years. That's one of the reasons why Pasquales gets annoyed when people say, oh, the birth of multi-messenger astrophysics today, 30 years ago. But so this is the sort of game that you're playing. And in fact, you will read many, if you look into the literature, you say, oh, uh, observed uh, Pamel axis, which is actually positron, but it's constrained by the antiprotons. Well, yeah, that's totally reasonable because if I want to explain Pamela, I need a certain, I need a certain cross section. I need a certain theoretical model that can produce those positrons. And if in the Lagrangian I cannot avoid terms that produce antipositrons, then I should see them. And if I don't see them with those densities needed, then it's not dark matter; it's something else. Okay, so it's a very funny game to play. The CMB, it's a dustbin. It's basically a calorimeter. When you play this game with the CMB, you know that everything that is produced, unless you um, bat neutrinos, they will lose energy and they will go into the dump bin. So actually, CMB is a fantastic way to measure. On the top of it, there is one thing that I did not introduce, and then I just want to introduce to tease your mind and then I'll let you go. I assumed that this sigma v is always the same, right? I said, in the galaxy or somewhere else, I'm looking at a certain sigma v. And it's the same annihilation cross-section that produces the radic abundance. Now, typically, as you've heard and you know, the cross-section of a process okay, so depending on the energy of the particle and therefore its velocity in the environment, this may be different because this is nothing else right in the milky way the particles are virialized to the halo to the, of the milky way so they have a typical velocity of 200 kilometers per second in a dwarf galaxy not it's smaller in the relic in the universe when you form the relic abundance is different so Still, you might have to want to account for those terms when you do it. 
when you perform your searches. But what most people do, or what you will often find, is exclusion plots, because unfortunately we haven't seen anything of this type. So dwarfs. So you will see constraints like from dwarfs with NFW. Then you will have galactic center in gammas, or galactic center in antiprotons. No, you cannot point. It's galactic center in gammas. Assuming an anastone or something of the kind, you she will probably not find because people are going to cheat and going to put a spiked profile that gives you a stronger constraint and put together something like it was immense from the galaxy. This is the sort of things that you will see. And, they, and the regions above are forbidden because we haven't identified it yet. Okay? And of course, the CMB, which has been ruling for several years. We were so proud, Sylvia and myself, when we did this. Okay? So ask me questions. If I just didn't confuse your mind. So what, you, what could you do for, uh, in order to lower the error bus? Better observation. Okay, when? <laughs> you had experts on gamma rays and... Uh, and particles before. This is just observational. And obviously, those error bars are not real. That I'm just. That you are limited by the actual observation. This is something that people have to understand. And people do understand. Of course, there's a lot of techniques to reduce them. And I'm just giving you a very rough primer. So, could you tell us more or less what kind of regions are still allowed in that parameter space? What kind of mass ranges? What kind of sigma v's? Well, all the regions that have not been observed. Yeah. So, what kind of let's put it. No, this is a very good question. So, and what sort of candidates are still? I'm not going to get into what sort of okay. candidates because it's a very complicated question to answer. But let us say that. You, you are motivated in doing all this by the fact that you are thinking that you want to reconstruct the, the WIMP miracle, the standard WIMP miracle. So you want to get to something around here, which is 3, 10 to the minus 26. OK? All right. With a mass scale of 100 GeV. When I was a student a few years ago, the observations got somewhere around here. So you were observing level of, flux, of, of gamma fluxes or equivalents that would have been produced by something above thermal relics. So you had to have a higher cross section and a mass smaller. Now you are sensitive to the flux that would be produced by a thermal relic around up to 100 GB, somewhere of the kind. Now I don't have the plot on the top of my mind. Of course, assuming that the sigma v is the same, so it's what it goes under S-wave approximation, because it doesn't depend on the velocity. I might be mistaken, and for some, but of course, again, this depends on the channel, this depends on the uh, dark matter density. For instance, the dwarfs have this advantage that since you are integrating the old objects out, even if you're integrating the square density, you are not so sensitive to the, um, to, to the profile that you adopt. 
So in a way, that's more solid in terms of uh, dark matter density. If you use the CMB, in which you're not using the gammas, but it's the same process, you're not sensible at all to the dark matter density profile because you are probing something which doesn't collapse into dark matter density profile. The density field is purely cosmological. And they all gather around here. So the thermal relic is open for the TV scale at the moment. That's why people were so excited about CT or the CTA. The point is that I'm not a theorist and I don't know how many natural candidates you would expect. I mean, if you are a theorist, this plot doesn't mean anything. You take your Lagrangian, your dark matter is a point in this space. Is that clear? In fact, when you rule out a region of this space, then you typically go back to the Lagrangian space and say, oh, what does it mean, right? Are we done? Are you tired? You wanna go home? Let's go get a drink. Thank you for staying here. So let, let me say a few words. So let me say a few words. There, the organizers, there's many organizers in the school. So Johannes supported the, the school from the very beginning. That's, that's very important. And also Peter de Souza, who has not been here, uh, supported the school from the very beginning. Pasquale Blasi had nothing to do, uh, I mean, no, sorry, nothing to gain from this school, as a matter of fact. He supported, he decided to come and teach, he put his name. So that's very important. These are very busy people, and I think they deserve credit because they did a lot. Um, the institute put the money. Uh, so there's been a lot of effort coming into here. You've seen me more than others, but that doesn't mean that others, actually they contributed a lot. So thank you for coming here. I hope you had a good time. You learned things. And uh, well, I'm going for a drink right now. So if you want to follow me. <laughs>